Hello, I'm Scott Cameron from Beezer, and I want to welcome you to the webinar on the Cascadia Megaquake Earthquake Early Warning and Tsunami Modeling. This is the final webinar in a three-part series on the Megaquake. Our speakers for today are Drs. Richard Allen of the University of California, Berkeley, and Dr. Diego Melgar of the University of Oregon. The webinar series addresses a key question. Is the West Coast ready for a 9.0 magnitude earthquake followed by a large tsunami? Data collected over the last 30 years show that multiple giant earthquakes and associated local tsunamis have struck the Pacific Northwest for at least the past 10,000 years. The 800 mile long Cascadia subduction zone, which extends from Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and to Southern British Columbia, is the main source of these earthquakes and the accompanying tsunamis. This three-part webinar series looks at the science and engineering associated with the earthquake source, the hazards, current strategies to mitigate loss of life, and emerging opportunities in early warning and reducing uncertainty. Now, just a few quick things before we get started. First, the audio for today's event will be streamed through your computer speakers or phone. We will be taking questions through the Q&A box located on the bottom toolbar of the Zoom screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click send. The moderator will get to as many questions as possible in the final 15 minutes of the webinar. <clears throat> Second, this webinar is being recorded. Please understand that any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. A link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides, will be posted on our website within the next week or so. And third, if you have any technical issues during the event, please try restarting the login process. Please also note this is being recorded and the video and audio will be posted. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, Dr. Richard Allen. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, hopefully, uh, you can now see my uh, my screen. So it's great. I'm very much happy to be participating in this this seminar series. Um, we've been thinking a lot about Cascadia and and the the science of Cascadia, the hazards of Cascadia, and so I'm delighted to kind of talk a little bit about earthquake early warning um, and how earthquake early warning can really help mitigate the uh, the hazards in Cascadia. So I've been tasked with talking about Shake Alert today. Um, and so Shake Alert is a, an earthquake early warning system, an incipient earthquake early warning system, if you like, um, for the US West Coast. So covering California, Oregon, and Washington, which of course um, includes Cascadia. Um, and so I'm gonna give an overview of what earthquake early warning is about, um, how earthquake early warning uh, works, and, and sort of where we are with this project. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Diego, who's gonna kind of extend that to talking about the really big earthquakes, which of course is what we're worried about in Cascadia, um, and also talking about the potential to do local tsunami warning as well. So um, uh, I'm at the UC Berkeley Seismology Lab, but really I'm representing a much larger group that's been working on ShakeAlert, and you can see the institutions involved. This is by no means even all of the institutions involved. I'm focusing on the, the sort of key project participants here. ShakeAlert is a, a USGS uh, project. It will be the USGS issuing alerts later this year. Um, and then, of course, the universities that run the seismic networks um, have been very involved in the development of the concept and now the implementation, and that's Caltech, UC Berkeley, University of Oregon, and the University of Washington. And I also want to acknowledge the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, who really made an investment in the research that has led to ShakeAlert. Um, and now I'm pleased to say that the both federal and state governments are what are really now taking on the funding piece. So I'm going to give an overview. And, and the bottom line here is that ShakeAlert's coming this year. The plan is to start issuing uh, warnings up and down the West Coast later this year. Um, hence the, the, the line here coming to a phone near you. And I'll explain, I'll explain what that means in a moment. Okay. So I want to back up a little bit and start by talking about alerts and thinking about alerts and explaining why alerts are important and why earthquake alerts are also important. So I think in the modern uh, era where we all have communications in our pockets, we've come to really expect 
alerts for a whole variety um, of different uh, purposes. Um, hurricane alerts, of course, have been around for a long time, and I don't think we could imagine not getting alerts and warnings in the run-up to hurricanes. Of course, those alerts have more time associated with them, by which I mean days or hours, um, as a hurricane is approaching a region, but we've come to expect these alerts and we've come to understand how to respond to them. Same for tornadoes. Tornado uh, warnings and watches have been around for many years. Um, tornado warnings are a much shorter time scale. Now we're talking about minutes of warnings. And the other thing that this image really illustrates is, of course, you issue a tornado warning to a region, um, but then the actual specific houses in this case that the tornado affects is only some subset of that. And so that's something to bear in mind. We push out warnings to wide uh, regions that could be affected by an event and then some portion, only some portion of that region is then typically affected. Bringing this a little closer to home, for me, um, in Northern California at the end of last year we had some very serious fires that I think everybody knows about that really went through entire neighborhoods um, in a matter of hours one night resulted in many fatalities and resulted in many people asking why did we not get a warning? Why did we not get a warning in the hours and minutes running up to this disaster that this was underway? And there's a lot of um, soul searching about why is it as a society we're not able to get these warnings out to people so they can get themselves out of harm's way. Of course, fires then continued in January in Southern California and were then followed by serious mudslides. And again, there was a lack of warnings for these mudslides, which led to fatalities. Um, and people are responding to that. In fact, right now, today, thousands of people have evacuated in Southern California because of the storms that we've just had coming through in the last day or two um, in order to get out of the way. So my point is that we're used to getting alerts we are actually expecting more and more alerts, more and more accurate information, and people are used to responding to them and understand the consequences of not responding to these alerts. So why not earthquake alerts? Um, here's a typical image, I think, for what we can expect from an earthquake in the United States. We're very fortunate in the US um, to have building codes that mean that we don't expect many buildings or all buildings to collapse. Some, of course, may. Um, but this is perhaps a more typical um, representation of what we should be as expecting after an earthquake. And that is that the building is still standing, but the interior contents is, is, um, has been thrown around, ceiling tiles are falling down, bookcases have fallen over. Um, and so when it comes to getting an alert, getting an alert to protect yourself from this kind of um, damage, from the injuries of being in this room is, is what we're really talking about. Again, closer to home for me, the Napa earthquake a couple of years ago um, had just one fatality, but this is a fireplace that collapsed into a living room. And again, having a few seconds of alert um, will allow you to get out of harm's way, move to a safe zone. And so that's kind of what we're thinking about when we're talking about um, earthquake early warning. And then just to finish, this is, I just was stunned by this image. I can't help but include it. This was uh, in, again in the aftermath of the Napa earthquake. Um, needless to say, there are many, many aftershocks, um, and this guy really shouldn't have his head in this crack, given that there's a very high probability of the aftershock when this picture was taken on the day of the Napa earthquake. And this is really just to illustrate that there are many specific examples where having um, a, a few seconds of warning to protect yourself really is very valuable. So that's what we're talking about, earthquake alerts. And the point is that this is possible. This is already being done in various parts around the world. And to illustrate that, I wanna show um, this video from Mexico City. The siren that you can hear in the background in this video is actually the early warning system that puts out this uh, message across Mexico City. That's why all of these people are in the street because they have a warning. And this video obviously illustrates the value of having had that warning, of having had a little bit of time to actually get out of the building. And in fact, just to, while this is an unreinforced masonry type building, and there are not so many of these buildings in the US, this sort of Ill also illustrates that the actual damage is actually significantly into the earthquake. The shaking had actually been going on 
for some time by the time that this building uh, in collapsed. But so the point here is that earthquake early warning is possible. Other countries are doing it and it's useful. Okay, so let's back up and um, what is earthquake early warning and, and why is it possible um, to, to do earthquake early warning? So for most people, they think of earthquakes as being an instantaneous process. The earthquake is the moment at which they feel shaking. And of course, that's not the case. For earthquakes, particularly large magnitude earthquakes, there's a significant amount of time between when the earthquake starts and when people uh, feel shaking. So this is an animation, it's obviously a cartoon, but it's running in real time, and it's gonna show a magnitude eight coming down the San Andreas Fault. That broad brown line is the actual rupture coming down the fault. The circles are the seismic energy, so the yellow circles are the P waves, and so for people in the Bay Area, in this particular scenario, they would just start to feel the P waves. And these P waves, they, they, you would feel it for sure, but everybody would look at one another and, and probably assume that this is a relatively small earthquake that's close by and that, that will stop momentarily. It's really not until the S wave arrives that you would start to expect to see any kind of damage for this sort of earthquake. And so the S wave obviously right now, the red circle is just beginning to propagate across the Bay Area. So now there would be really very strong shaking and you might expect there to be, um, to be damage. But the strongest shaking and most damage won't actually occur until the fault rupture itself passes by San Francisco. That's still another 30 seconds away. And so this is just to illustrate that earthquakes, big earthquakes, they take a significant amount of time from when they start um, until, until they finish or until potentially the shaking um, is felt in your particular location. This of course is for Northern California, but we could spin this map around upside down and this could be a magnitude eight coming up the San Andreas Fault towards Los Angeles, or rather than going south from the Mendocino Triple Junction, we could go north and this could be a magnitude nine rupture um, on the Cascadia subduction zone. It doesn't matter. The point is that these events take time and the concept behind early warning is to recognize an earthquake when it starts as rapidly as possible and then provide a warning to people um, before they start to feel the shaking. So that's the concept. So who could actually make use of early warning? There's a whole range of users, but for me, I think that the most valuable use, or at least the first use that we want to be thinking about for early warning is about personal protection, is what do I do to protect myself um, during the course of an earthquake? And so the, the key thing to be doing there is to be reducing um, the, the likelihood of being injured. The image on the right is the one I showed at the beginning from the Northridge earthquake. Um, but when we look at both the Northridge and the Loma Prieta earthquake, just as being two examples of, of relatively serious earthquakes in, um, in the US, in the Loma Prieta earthquake, more than 50% of injuries were linked to falls, people falling. And in Northridge, more than 50% um, were due to non-structural hazards, fall, uh, so bookcases, things like that, falling on top of you. So the point here being that is if everybody received just a few seconds of warning, if everybody then dropped, took cover and hold on to do exactly the same thing that you should do in an earthquake anyway, then we could potentially reduce the number of injuries in an earthquake by more than 50%. That's a significant impact in terms of reducing um, the effects uh, of an earthquake. In the case of Northridge, it's estimated that the cost of just the injuries is somewhere between two and three billion dollars. So for the people who want to do the cost benefit analysis of this, there's a huge saving to be made by, by doing early warning. And, and for me, I think this kind of reaction, individual response to protect themselves in an earthquake, is perhaps the most, uh, at least most important uh, role use of early warning and probably one of the first um, applications of early warning we would want to see. But then there's a whole other range of applications related to automated control, slowing and stopping trains. The trains in the Bay Area have actually been using ShakeAlert, the research version of ShakeAlert, since 2012 to slow and stop trains. But other kinds of automated response include stopping elevators, um, isolating hazardous machinery and chemicals, uh, data security issues, um, so that you don't lose massive amounts of data sets and just general situation awareness. So there's, there's many potential applications for earthquake early warning. So how do you get the warning? I mean, the answer to that, I think, is we want to push out warnings in as many ways um, as possible. 
the first uh, way that everybody thinks of is through using smartphones or cell phones, which the majority of people have in their pocket or in their bag um, pretty much all the time. And so what might that look like? Well, this is an app. Earthquake, duck cover and hold on. Strong shaking expected. This is an app that we created here at the Berkeley Seismo Lab a few years ago just to demonstrate the capabilities of doing this. So this is a real app that gets warnings from ShakeAlert. Um, this version of the app gives you a countdown until you might expect the shaking. It also gives you a sense of the strength of shaking that you might expect. So this is one way um, that you could receive the alert but you could also receive it on your computer. This is an image of the what's called the user display that ShakeAlert has, has built um, to display the, the warnings on a desktop computer. But as we move to a public system, this alert should, of course, be pushed out through a whole variety of approaches. TV, radio, your home security system could get the warning, office PA systems, etc. And exactly what the nature of the warning should be, the messaging itself, is also something that is still under discussion, under debate. Um, but recent lessons in Mexico um, are sort of beginning to suggest that the message should really be as simple as possible. It should just be earthquake drop cover and hold on, that kind of message, rather than this more detailed information perhaps that I'm, I'm showing here. And so finally, I don't know, I hope that this is going to work. I want to demonstrate that the technology exists. And I, rather than me telling you it exists, I want to have um, Rachel Maddow tell you um, that it exists with this short little clip um, from, the, uh, from the Rachel Maddow show a couple of years ago. Digital communications travel at the speed of light. Thanks to things like fiber optic cable, we can move information literally in a flash. And that is good, you know, just in the abstract. But that is, it turns out, potentially life-saving. If the information that you are moving at the speed of light is notification that an earthquake is about to happen. Uh, earthquakes happen in a specific place in the ground, right? Earthquakes happen at the center. But you don't just feel an earthquake at the epicenter the shuddering waves of motion in the earth from an earthquake, they, they emanate out from the epicenter of the quake, traveling at the speed of sound. So if you had the kind of motion sensors that detected earthquakes, if you had seismometers along fault lines all over earthquake prone regions, when there was an earthquake, the seismometers nearest to the epicenter, they could register that an earthquake has happened, right? Feel the shake. And then they could send a digital signal at the speed of light, notifying communities nearby that this traveling at the speed of sound tremor, this motion of the earth is about to arrive. And this is not a way of predicting earthquakes before they happen. It's a, it's a way of basically warning people that an earthquake has just happened and that they are about to feel its effects. Brace yourself. But this thing works. Scientists at UC Berkeley say that their shake alert to earthquake early warning project it set off an alert. It did go off this weekend during this weekend's large quake in Napa, California. It was about to be felt in Berkeley, and this is the alert that told them so. Watch this. Earthquake, earthquake, light, shaking, expected in three seconds. They got a 10 second warning that they were about to feel the quake. And 10 seconds is not much time, right? But this, this brace yourself warning system, it works thanks to the simple fact that the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound and earthquakes only move at the speed of sound. With more sensors in more places, they presumably deliver even more warning time. California is hoping to have that bigger system in place in the next few years if they can get it funded and finished. Uh, from the LA Times today, once fully developed, the system could give downtown Los Angeles 40 to 50 seconds of warning that the big one was headed from the San Andreas Fault, giving time for elevators to stop at the next floor and open up, for firefighters to open up garage doors, for high-speed trains to slow down to avoid derailment, and for surgeons to take the scalpel out of a patient. Giving your surgeon enough time to get the scalpel out of you before the giant earthquake starts shaking the operating room? That idea of a tectonically shaking scalpel inside your body somewhere, that is something you can never unknow, and I am sorry. But the idea that this warning technology, that it works, that it worked this weekend, in fact. It's not just on a drawing board somewhere. It is in effect, and it could be expanded and is being expanded. 
that is an excellent thing. They've got a system like this in Japan. They've got it in Mexico and some other places around the globe. California could get their whole statewide system done in a few years. God bless the geeks. They will save us all. Now it's time for the last bird with Lawrence O'Donnell. Hi, Lawrence. Rachel, I just want them to make the earthquake warning voice a little less scary. Yeah, a little more soothing. <laughs> Maybe with a little music or something. Right. Ding dong. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. So this video is two years old at this point. So this has been possible for some time. Um, Needless to say, it is complicated. We are getting very close, though. And the good news is that this talks about California, but we're not talking about California. We're talking about the entire West Coast for earthquake early warning. So today, ShakeAlert is spanning the West Coast as a whole, by which I mean California, Oregon, and Washington. ShakeAlert is running and detecting earthquakes and pushing out alerts to test users as we speak, um, using over 800 seismic stations um, that run up and down the West Coast. This data is streaming continuously into four processing centers and about 75 institutions currently get the alerts from this test system. And so, so this is why we're ready to start talking about the being public warning or limited public warning later this year, because we know that this is, this is possible. We know that uh, we have a system that is generating alerts um, and it's time to move forward. And I just kind of want to again emphasize that this is being done through this broad collaboration uh, with the USGS as the lead agency, Berkeley, University of Washington, Caltech, and Oregon. And of course, also with state partners as we move forward um, in, in all three states. Um, it's, it requires a lot of people to get coordinated to make this happen. And, and, and that is exactly what's happening, which is great to see. So, so in terms of building ShakeAlert, um, what is it that we need to do to get to this, this limited public rollout? Well, the cost estimate that was put a, together a few years ago by the group for what it would cost is about $16 million per year, plus about $38 million of infrastructure upgrade. Um, and the, the good news is that um, there's good news and then there's even more good news. The good news is that, that we're pretty much 50% funded. So last year, uh, Congress allocated $10 million. Um, and then in terms of the infrastructure, there's, there was $10 million for California. Um, Oregon also contributed some funding. Um, and then in addition, another $10 million is in the budget um, for California this year. Um, but the really good news is as of a few hours ago when President Trump signed the FY18 budget. In fact, that includes a significant increase for ShakeAlert, going from that $10 million last year up to $23 million this year. Um, and that's an increase for the operating costs, but it's also a ten, another additional $10 million for the infrastructure to add the additional stations. So this is as of literally two hours ago, which is why it's not on this slide. But we're getting, we're not all the way there, but we're getting pretty close to what the target was in terms of this funding. Um, and our ability to operate the system is sort of similarly far along. In terms of the algorithms, I would say the algorithms are pretty much 90% of the way there, at least they're 90% of the way in terms of being ready to issue alerts based on the simple algorithms, the point source algorithms. There's still plenty more research to be done to improve the algorithms for the really big earthquake, and that's what Diego is going to be focusing on. But then the other piece is the sensors. We're about 50% of the way there with the sensors. This additional funding that, uh, that was finalized this morning will actually really help move us forward to, to building out the, the rest of those sensors. But despite the fact that we're only sort of 50% there in terms of building out the system, we're still moving towards this limited public rollout um, later this year. October is the, uh, the, the target date at this point. And there's a lot of discussion going on within the ShakeAlert project right now as to what the scope of the limited public rollout should be. As I already mentioned, there are already a group of users out there um, that are automatically responding to these alerts, BART being one example, the Metro system in LA being another. There are up and down, up and down Cascadia as well as California, of course. There are a group of providers, alert providers, that are getting engaged with the project in order to broadcast the, um, the warning to, to more users. This includes early warning labs, regroup, and, and sky alert. So this is a way of taking that kernel of an alert and pushing it out to lots of users. 
And then the really exciting prospect is the idea that wireless emergency alerts, this is the amber alert system that we all get on our phones, may also be able to issue the alerts come this fall. Exactly how fast they will be able to do that is not clear. Um, it may not be as fast as we would like, but this really opens up the possibilities of reaching a very large group of people later this year. We'll have to see how that pans out. To give one example that I think those of us involved in the Shake Alert project are particularly um, excited about is to use smartphone apps to deliver the alert to school teachers. This is the idea here is that in schools it's a relatively controlled environment. We can train students to react in an appropriate fashion to the alerts. They already do earthquake drills, of course. Um, and so by putting an app on teachers' phones, we can potentially reach a large group of people pretty quickly. Again, I wanted to give a sense of, of where we are and what might be possible. Specifically deciding who gets the alerts and when these alerts get rolled out still has to be decided. And of course, that's a decision that the USGS has to make because they're the, the responsible agency for actually issuing the alerts. Um, but just to sort of wrap up, we're kind of ready to do this. Um, just to illustrate that, I'm going to just take one specific example. It happens to be very local to me. It was right beneath Berkeley, but this is the magnitude 4.4 earthquake um, just a month or so ago, I guess a couple of months ago now. Um, of course, this isn't the kind of earthquake that would do any damage, but this is an earthquake right beneath the metropolitan environment. Um, and the warning shake alert pushed out a warning for this earthquake in just a few seconds. Um, there, is, there is the likelihood for these events that there will be a region very close to the epicenter that gets no warning. And that's what's illustrated by the red circle on the, in the diagram on the right. But this also demonstrates just how quickly the system is now reacting and is pushing out the warning. So I think this is just another demonstration that ShakeAlert is ready for this test and for this, this limited public rollout. And so that system, the system that pushed out the alert for the magnitude 4.4 is a, a, an algorithm that's based on point source, which is a great place for us to get started. However, as we know, Cascadia is, uh, is ready for a very large earthquake, as is the San Andreas Fault. And so in order to do better than that, we need to be able to treat large magnitude earthquakes differently. Um, and so that's the point at which I'm going to stop. And I'm going to hand over to Diego um, to start talking about that. Thanks, Richard. I'm sharing my screen right now. Okay, so that's right. So what we're concerned about in the Cascadia subduction zone are these very large um, magnitude events. And this requires a different treatment than what we can currently do with, with what Richard described as the point source algorithms. So what I'll talk about today is a lot more focused still on research and less on operational realities, but we're making good progress. Uh, the research uh, for tsunami early warning has mostly been carried out by these West Coast universities, but we really have been working closely together with both tsunami warning centers, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Honolulu and the National Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer, Alaska, who have really been great at teaching us how they think about tsunami warning, what they need, how they respond, what responsibilities do they have, so that we can tailor our algorithms and research towards stuff that is actually useful to them. And of course, all of this under the auspices of NOAA and uh, NASA, who's funded a lot of the GPS effort that I'll show you here today. So in, Cal in Oregon, in, in Washington, and Cascadia in general, we know that large events have happened in the past. And we know this with quite a high degree of certainty, especially because of places like this. This is the Nesco and Ghost Forest in coastal Oregon, where we know that every single one of these cedar and spruce trees died um, on the exact same year. And we know that that's because the tsunami came ashore, the land subsided during a magnitude nine earthquake, and the trees cannot live in the salty water and eventually died. So we know because of observations like these and others that these large events happen roughly every 300 years. And we know that the last one, we know it to the day, happened on January 26th of the year 1700. Now, this is our Cascadia subduction zone where I will focus for the rest of my talk. Here is Oregon in Washington, uh, the Northern California borders here, Portland's around here, Seattle, this is the Puget Sound area, and this is Seattle. 
Of course, these big earthquakes happen because of plate tectonics, because we have the Juan de Fuca plate right here moving towards North America roughly at two inches per year, basically the speed at which your fingernails grow, and crashing into the North American continent. And as it does so, every now and then, it will make large earthquakes, very large earthquakes. The size of the piece of fault that ruptures during these magnitude 9 events can be as big as 700 miles. Now, that's a very, very long distance. So our first challenge for issuing tsunami warning alerts is to be able to accurately measure a behemoth, a giant of this size, to measure it in real time and to measure it accurately. The second challenge is to do it quickly. We know because of the speeds at which tsunamis typically propagate, we know exactly how much time we will have to issue a warning. We know that the tsunami waves will likely originate closest to the trench. This is this blue line, the deepest part of the ocean offshore Cascadia. And we know the distances from the trench to the coast. They range between 40 miles roughly in southern Oregon to 80 miles here in the Olympic Peninsula. That means that the first tsunami waves from one of these large events will arrive in five to 10 minutes. So that's the second challenge. After measuring this gigantic event and doing the best that we possibly can, we have to issue a forecast of what we expect the tsunami wave heights to be in under five minutes for it to be useful to the people that are immediately in harm's way. Now the third challenge, which is somewhat related, is that these events are very infrequent. The last one was 317 years ago. So how do we know that we're doing well? Unlike shake alerts that can be exercised regularly with these small magnitude events, we haven't had a big event in Cascadia in a really long time. So the third challenge is coming up with a proper assessment of whether our algorithms and our research are functioning correctly and providing the best possible and useful tsunami warning alerts. So this is what we're talking about here for the Cascadia subduction zone. This is a picture of the Tohoku tsunami that happened in Japan in 2011. This is a beautiful model put together by uh, NOAA's PMEL uh, group, and it shows the tsunami amplitudes all across the Pacific Basin. The tsunami warning centers both in, in Honolulu and Alaska are experts at this kind of warning, where they can issue warning from a, an event that starts anywhere in the world. They issue warning to people downstream and across the Pacific where we have hours of lead time. They've been doing this for 50, 60 years now with great success. But where the frontier lies is in this white box, this region immediately adjacent to the earthquake where we only have minutes of lead time. It is there where we still have a lot of work and a lot of improvements to do. I'll, I'll remind you that even though um, the tsunami warning centers have been around for a while, Japan is the only country in the world that currently today has a local tsunami warning system that was built for that very express purpose of warning the people immediately next to a large earthquake. That's the situation right now worldwide. So I'd like to explore a little bit how that system performed in Japan and see if there's any lessons that, that we can take from that. What happened in, in 2011 in Japan was that their system even though the earthquake magnitude was nine, we now know with the benefit of hindsight, it was a magnitude nine system. The actual magnitude computed by the real time system never grew above a magnitude eight. This is a condition known as magnitude saturation. Basically, we cannot tell the large from the very large. We can't tell them apart with just seconds to minutes. And as a result, this is the warning that came out of the public local tsunami warning system in Japan, where red means major tsunami, Orange means a significant tsunami, and yellow means a tsunami height is estimated to be about half a meter. This is what happened in three minutes. Now, this is what the tsunami warning should have looked like. And this is the map that came out 13 hours after the earthquake. This is now long after the, the first waves have arrived everywhere across the Japanese islands. It's because of this magnitude saturation that this map, which was the real tsunami, was not issued in three minutes. This condition of magnitude saturation is, is a real problem for us, especially in Cascadia, because we will have these very large events. So using our, the experiences from our, from our Japanese colleagues, we tried to research why and how could we fix this kind of problem. To understand why these large events are tricky, we need to think about their real sizes. So here are the, these rectangles represent the fault areas, the sizes of fault 
that broke in some of these famous California earthquakes. Here's the Napa event that Richard just spoke about. The chunk of earth that broke in that event was roughly 20 miles across. If you go up all the way to the Mexicali earthquake, which some people in Southern California might remember in 2010, that was about 100 miles long. And in between, here's the Loma Prieta earthquake, the World Series earthquake of 1989, magnitude 6.9 was roughly 40 miles across. I've scaled them down here. So here are those California events. And here's what subduction zone events, like the ones in Cascadia, here's what they look like. Here's how they compare to the California events. They're truly massive. That Japan earthquake is almost 400 miles across. The earthquake in Indonesia and in Sumatra that caused the big tsunami that killed more than 200,000 people, magnitude 9.2, was almost 600 almost 800 miles across. So these big events are truly, truly large. And as a result, seismometers, the rulers that we use to measure earthquakes, they have a really hard time measuring things this big. It's possible, but it's very, very difficult. So what we proposed and what we started working on and what seems to be a very reasonable path forward is to use other kinds of measurement devices of sensing technologies to see if a big earthquake is, is going to get big. And it turns out that one of the best solutions for this problem is GPS. So this is high quality GPS, not like the GPS on your phone. Here's a GPS antenna measuring signals to GPS satellites in the sky, solar panels to power it, and a, and a satellite uplink to beam the data back to a processing center. This GPS is different. So you are all used to GPS on your phones because you, when you open up Google Maps to find a place for dinner, you ask the phone to tell you where you are, that phone GPS can tell you where you are roughly within 15 feet inside this blue circle. The kind of scientific GPS that we're using for warning technologies is much more precise. It can tell you where you are or the position of the antenna to roughly within an inch. This is about the size of, of a quarter coin. So it's very different. It's also more expensive than what you have on your phone. But it turns out to be extremely useful. So Japan, during that 2011 earthquake, actually had a very dense network of these high quality GPS stations, but it wasn't at the time being used for any kind of warning. However, we can study the data to see um, how it could have been used had it been available in real time to the, to the warning groups over there. This data shows what the, how the GPS stations move during that magnitude nine earthquake. Here on the left, we're watching the horizontal motion of the entire uh, island of Honshu in Japan. These coastal sites are moving almost five meters. They're lurching five meters towards the ocean during the earthquake. Here on the right hand side, you have the vertical motion of the GPS stations, and you can see that these coastal sites subsided by about a meter. Now, what's important is that you don't need to be a genius seismologist to figure out that because of the way these arrows are distributed, the most likely area to have ruptured during the earthquake is more or less um, there the hypocenter is the red star. So this kind of analysis where we take these patterns of arrows to figure out how big the earthquake is, is what we really need to be doing in Cascadia um, and elsewhere. And we know for a fact that this works because we've retrospectively looked at other big earthquakes around the planet to see if this kind of GPS approach would work. What I'm showing you here are the GPS magnitude calculations. If we take these stations from many earthquakes in Japan, here's an earthquake in Chile, over here's an earthquake in Costa Rica, for example. The dashed lines are the true magnitudes of the events, and the blue lines are how we predict the magnitude, what we predict the magnitude to be using these GPS stations. For that Japan case, by about 100 seconds after the start of the earthquake, that number is seconds, we would have known that it was a magnitude nine, so we completely avoid the issue of saturation. In Chile, for this magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake, by about 50 seconds, we would have known it was an 8.8. .8. Another example here, the Nicoya earthquake in Costa Rica, by about 20 seconds, we would have known it was a magnitude 7.6. So from these kinds of tests, we know that this approach of using GPS works. But GPS is more than just a magnitude ruler. It actually can tell you what kind of earthquake is unfolding. Here, I've calculated for you what the GPS vectors would look like if you had stations everywhere on the surface of the earth for what we call a strike slip earthquake. This is a lateral faulting event where one block of the fault moves laterally uh, with respect to the other side of the fault. This is what we get in California with a San Andreas fault, for example. The vectors would have this particular pattern on the surface of the earth. This is the horizontal motion of the GPS stations. 
If we now look at a similar size magnitude event, same magnitude, magnitude seven, but now it's a thrust earthquake where one block of the fault moves above the other block of the fault. This is the kind of event that we get in Cascadia. This is what a magnitude nine in Cascadia would do. The pattern of the arrows is very, very different. So just by examining these patterns, we would be able to say not just the magnitude, but what kind of event um, we are contemplating or is unfolding in real time. And that turns out to be very important because both of these kinds of events make very different vertical deformations. So this strike slip event, if you ask how it moves the surface of the earth up and down, you'll get a pattern like this one where the vertical deformation is very small, less than five centimeters and only concentrated on these small narrow areas. That same magnitude seven event, if it's a thrust earthquake, can actually have a substantial vertical deformation of the surface of the earth. Now, if you put the ocean over this vertical deformation, this is what makes a tsunami. This moving up and moving down of the water column will generate the destructive tsunami waves. So it's really important to know not just the magnitude, but the kind of earthquake that is going on. And GPS can do that for us. Now, we know that this is more than an academic exercise. Just this year, on, in January in 2018, we had a magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Alaska that happened right here, very close to the trench. If you're in a tsunami warning center and an earthquake happens there, you get really worried because we know that these earthquakes have made very large tsunamis in the past. It turns out that this earthquake was one of those lateral strike slip events. So it really didn't make a big tsunami because it mostly moves the earth side to side, not up and down. So that made less than 30 centimeters um, of tsunami impacts in the islands closer to the earthquake. Same magnitude event, magnitude 7.8, but in 2010, in Indonesia, that event, because it was a thrust earthquake and because it was very shallow, that made a 19 meter tsunami, much, much bigger, that had substantial effects on the islands here in Indonesia and also on the main islands of Sumatra. So we need to know the kind of earthquake, not just the magnitude. Now, in the Western US, I think we're in pretty good shape. This is the GPS network. There's actually not every single GPS station, most of them. This is what it looks like today. So we act, we're actually poised to take these kinds of algorithms that I just described that can identify magnitude and kind of faulting. We can use them now today to issue the kinds of local warnings that we need. There's actually also stations on uh, Vancouver Island from the Canadian Geological Survey, but they're not pictured here. So we're in good shape. So for challenge number one, which is to measure accurately a gigantic events in real time, I think that is more or less solved. Now we need to complete the, the road and going from research to operations. The challenge, the second challenge, which is forecasting the tsunami amplitude in that quick time, once we know the magnitude and the style of faulting of the, the earthquake, we're also doing great there. So this is a, a tsunami model from, again, from the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. They have a code called RIFT. RIFT needs to know the magnitude and the kind of, of earthquake that you're dealing with, and it can very quickly estimate what the tsunami will be. And this is for a scenario earthquake in the Cascadia subduction zone. And these are the amplitudes that Rift is predicting all across Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, California, and down into Mexico. You can see the scale of the tsunami over here on the left. So these models can actually run quickly once we know what the earthquake is doing. Now, how good are they? How good are these kinds of forecasts? Yes, we can make them, but do they compare to what the actual tsunami does in real life? Well, that's actually an, an open question that we're working on. I show you here an example of an earthquake in Chile. This is that magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake in Chile. It made a big tsunami. This black line here shows the amplitude of the tsunami everywhere along the coast for the Chilean earthquake. It's our best reconstruction of what actually happened in real life during the tsunami. Over here on the right is what the forecast would have been in two to three minutes after the start of the earthquake using these kinds of GPS methods. You can see that the pattern of the black lines is not exactly right, but overall the peak amplitudes are fairly well matched. The other thing that we have done here is we've colored every county, they're called regions in Chile, every county by its corresponding warning level. And what ends up happening is that even if you don't get the details quite right for every single wiggle here of the forecast amplitude, the levels of warning are still okay because we, can, we only need forecast, uh, forecasts across an entire region, not necessarily at the level of hundreds of meters, for example. But this isn't always the case. In that earthquake, I think we do okay. 
here's an earthquake where things are a little trickier. This is another earthquake in northern Chile, magnitude 8.3. Again, this black line is our best reconstruction of what actually happened during the real tsunami. And here's that black line for what we can actually do with these rapid GPS models. You see that we underestimate the tsunami in this region compared to what happened in reality. Now the colors or the level of warning that each region would receive, they're not so far off. This region right here still gets red, which is the correct level of warning, but overall the warning is underestimated in other parts of the country for this particular event. So GPS driven models of tsunami inundation will be fast. And in my opinion, they'll probably be good enough, but some level of uncertainty will always remain with these kinds of models. There will always, we, we will always have some, we will have missed some details of the earthquake source that we don't get quite right. However, I think that's okay. So I think that more or less solves challenge number two, which is to forecast the tsunami. Obviously we can do more work to make it better, but I think we're on a good path. Now the final challenge for, for this is challenge number three, which is because these events are infrequent, how do we test uh, our systems? And, and this is what we do. We create scenario events. This is a scenario event for the Cascadia subduction zone. You can watch the event as it ruptures. That's what this guy moving here is showing. And we generate scenario GPS data. You can see these arrows as they unfold. We generate thousands of these scenarios and we put them into our real time system. And we ask how well do we do? Well, that's shown down here. The real magnitude of the scenario event is this dashed line. The red line is what the magnitude calculation is for a seismic only system. It exhibits that saturation that we're now familiar with. But the blue line is how well the GPS system would have done for this particular event. And you see that by about 70 seconds, we get to the correct magnitude, which is good news um, for tsunami warning. We do this for 1300 events, and this is work done by Christine Rule. So what you're seeing here are 1300 events, the real magnitude, scenario magnitude, and the magnitude from the rapid warning system. And you can see that overall, you wanna be close to this black line, which means you're calculating the magnitude correctly. And we're in good shape. We're usually within plus or minus 0 0.3 magnitude units of the simulated magnitude. So that is good news for Cascadia. Now, as I said, we will always miss some details. This is one of those scenario events. Earthquakes are, are, are messy. They have some parts of the fault move more than other parts of the fault, and that's what is shown here. You will concentrate motion in some parts of, uh, over other parts. This is what the predicted earthquake should look like from the real time system. So what we can do in real time is low resolution and blocky, and we can't get all the details quite right. And as a result, our tsunami forecast will also be uncertain. And that is something that will be difficult to overcome. So those are the three challenges and we have good solutions for them. And I'll finish and I'll wrap up with this. I think overall the outlook is quite positive. With continued effort for Cascadia, we will have warnings for tsunamis in under five minutes. All the key components are there, both GPS and tsunami modeling. And we're working closely with the tsunami warning centers to make the transfer from research to operations. So we're almost done, but not quite because of these details, these complexities in real earthquakes, where an earthquake of one single magnitude can make tsunamis that range from 30 centimeters to 19 meters, looking at tsunamis from on land with GPS will always be inherently uncertain because we're not measuring the actual tsunami itself. If we're uncomfortable with that uncertainty, the only real solution is to go offshore. And that's what Japan has done. Japan has installed this beautiful network of offshore sensors, offshore Honshu, and these guys, they measure the tsunami directly. So all that ambiguity with what the earthquake is doing goes away because we're measuring the tsunami and that's what we're interested in. These are real time cabled. It's the fastest, most reliable way to issue local warnings. It's also incidentally very useful for basic science, but it's very expensive. For Japan, it was $500 million to build this out and roughly $5 million a year to run it. This is a proposal for that, what that would look like in Cascadia put forth by a group at the University of Washington. A cable comes offshore and goes up and down Cascadia with nodes of stations um, for everybody to use for research and for warning. Now, is there a sufficiently relevant societal impact to warrant this expenditure? We're likely looking at something in the neighborhood of $1 billion to build something like this out. To my mind, the answer is yes, but that's obviously a very complex discussion which, was, which we still need to have. So I'll finish there, thank you.
I want to thank both of our speakers. You guys did a great job. And uh, I think we're going to have got a slide up here now that gives you some uh, guidance about how to submit questions. We have a few minutes for questions. I'm going to start out with a couple that, I, uh, that we ha had received earlier. Um, and then we'll take them from the audience. Uh, Richard, first question's for you. What is, you've made tremendous progress with ShakeAlert, but what is the remaining major challenge you still face to getting to the point where you can go public with your alerts on a wide scale? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's two pieces I would say. One is of course that the system is not fully built as I was sort of laying out the, in terms of the seismic stations, only 50% of the stations have been put out so far. We need to add the other half. However, as I also showed, the system is running very well in regions that have the stations that are pretty um, uh, closely, pretty dense already, which is primarily the urban areas on up and down the West Coast. So, I mean, I'm very excited about the possibility of the limited public rollout later this year. I think the greatest challenge, frankly, is fear of screwing up. And we as a seismology community really have to be ready to kind of take that extra step. As a community of scientists, it's not like engineers. Engineers have always had to design bridges or buildings um, that, that can withstand earthquakes. And they're used to that. As seismologists, I think we're less ready for that. We're less used to that. And I think that there's a lot of concern um, uh, amongst seismologists that, about are we ready to do this? We might make a mistake. The system might make a mistake. And, and we're, people are very concerned about that. And for good reason. It's good to, be, to recognize that. But I think that we really have to get past this. We have to start delivering the alerts. The system is working pretty well. What we've learned from Mexico is that the, the receivers of the information, the public, they understand that there are technical limitations to these systems, and they recognize that the system is not perfect, but they still see it as being valuable. That's what we've learned from Mexico. So we should use this to buoy us as a, as a community, the seismology community, to move forward. We obviously need to make sure that there's good education of the users, but then we need to just start, start doing this and, and, and actually get this running. So I think that that's the greatest challenge is, is taking that step and, and, and just getting started. Thanks. Uh, Diego, a question for you. You've shown us an exciting uh, new approach to uh, quantifying uh, tsunami predictions, actually why an earthquake is occurring. How does this approach, particularly with a forecast of wave heights, compare to the conventional approach that we've been relying on that's used to create the flood inundation maps that communities use for their, their emergency planning? It's, it's very similar and it uses, shares many of the same technologies. To make, to make these hazard maps, we basically propose scenarios or we look at earthquakes from the past and we make very painstaking models of the source with as many details as possible. We simulate the propagation and we do this hundreds of times maybe and we come up with these hazard maps. We're using many of the same technologies except we're doing it as quickly as possible with imperfect models with big uncertainties. So the technologies are shared. Um, but the information is not always shared. For example, the level of response that a community should have to warning should likely be tailored to what the expected hazard is. And I'm thinking of, of places like Crescent City here in California. They know that even the smallest tsunami is amplified in, in the Crescent City area. So they should take action at lower levels of forecasted wave heights than other um, parts of, of the coast, for example. So they're really, the hazards and warning are a continuum. We need to be working before the hazard. We need to be working during the hazard and after the hazard. And what we're discussing here is only the during portion of that hazard. But again, work needs to be done both before and after. Here's a, a question came in early on, really for both of you. How, um, clearly the subduction zone extends uh, further north than, than uh, the US into, into, into Vancouver Island area. How coordinated are we with our colleagues in Canada in extending something like Shake Alert or the tsunami uh, uh, warning system that, that Diego talked about uh, to cover the totality uh, of the zone at risk? So I can answer the seismic piece first, perhaps. Um, so as you saw on my map, you may have noticed the map when I showed the seismic stations that are feeding data into Shake Alert. That station coverage actually extends up into Canada. 
And obviously the geographic, uh, sorry, the political boundary is not the relevant boundary when it comes to the hazards. And that's why data from the Canadian stations um, is also streaming into ShakeAlert. And so what that allows is for ShakeAlert to actually be able to detect earthquakes just north of the border um, and include that information. And I believe that there is a sort of similar kind of discussions about using the warnings, using the information that comes out of ShakeAlert um, to issue warnings uh, north of the border. Of course, the USGS is the alerting agency for earthquakes here in, in the US. And so they will issue alerts in the US, but it will be up to the Canadian government about issuing alerts um, north of the border. But in terms of the science and the data, um, already we're crossing the border um, pretty seamlessly, I think. I think that's also true of the, of the GPS network. Uh, the collaboration with the, with the Canadians is, is good. It can always be better, but it's good. I think the real challenge for GPS or, or the next step is that this kind of technology can be used by the tsunami warning centers on a global scale. There's actually GPS networks in many, many parts of the world but it's a very real challenge to get countries to open up their GPS data to the tsunami warning centers. And it's strange because they already do it for the seismic data. So we still need to do some lobbying and some teaching and education and work with other communities to get them to open up and understand that there's a mutual benefit to sharing the data. Thanks. I, I have a couple questions here. One for each of you uh, probably came from folks who live in the uh, Puget Sound and Willamette Valley areas. Richard, how, how, how much warning time would we have for a uh, Cascadia uh, breakout, mega quake for the folks who live in Puget Sound and uh, the Portland Willamette Valley area? So the amount of warning for earthquake early warning is a function of the distance that you are from the epicenter. So if the earthquake starts a long way away, such as for when we're talking about Puget Sound, for example, if the earthquake starts down at the southern end of the Cascadia subduction zone, it's going to take about five minutes for that yeah. rupture to come all the way up um, the subduction zone. Now, one of the issues, one of the science questions that we are still working on is how quickly can we really determine um, how strong the shaking is going to be for you in Puget Sound if we see an earthquake starting to the south? So we can issue a warning immediately to say that there is a significant earthquake and this may uh, mean that there is just moderate shaking for you or it may mean there's very strong shaking and in that case there could be minutes worth of warning. If we want to issue alerts um, saying that there's going to be very strong shaking the warning may be less. But so in terms of people thinking about warning times we're talking about seconds, tens of seconds. Best case scenario is a few minutes but that we should be thinking about how we can react with warnings of a few seconds. And, and uh, to build on that or uh, to, to Diego, Diego, some questions about the potential impacts of the tsunamis extending, particularly in uh, the Straits of Juan de Fuca into Puget Sound, potentially impacting those communities in there. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that, that's ongoing work in mapping out the hazards of what will happen during the next big event. And it's actually quite interesting. The, the amplitudes are probably not going to be incredibly high. Tsunamis have a hard time getting into these shallow, narrow channels, but you could expect some really strong currents, sometimes for several days um, after the tsunami. So you wouldn't, I don't think, you wouldn't see some of these like 30 meter um, inundations that we see in places like Japan and Indonesia within Puget Sound, but you would see some, you know, meter level waves and definitely incredibly strong currents for quite a long while. One more question for, for, again, for both of you. Clearly, the costs in some of the uh, uh, programs that are being talked about, Shake Alert, uh, you know, it's well on its way, but it's still not, not cheap. And if we go to uh, some of the technologies Diego talked about for the offshore, uh, quite expensive. Uh, what new technologies are out there that might help bring some of these costs down that could uh, help make, uh, move this along? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I would say that um, I, I'm not sure that this is particularly expensive. I mean, the shake alert piece, the, the sort of $16 million per year to operate, for example, it's about twice what we currently spend or what we spent on seismic network monitoring previously, previous to earthquake early warning. So we're talking about sort of doubling the operational costs of the seismic networks in order to provide warnings for everybody. So I would challenge the idea that that's not particularly cheap. 
still, there, it's true that there are other technologies. Um, we, we are here at Berkeley, for example, we're starting to explore the use of smartphones to detect earthquakes. Now, there's no way that the cell phone detectors will ever replace the quality of the traditional seismic networks that ShakerLert currently uses. Needless to say, people are carrying them around. But we do think that we can use detection from smartphones to detect earthquakes. And then the logical next step, once you can detect earthquakes, is can you provide warnings? And that's something that we're exploring. We think that there is value for it, um, particularly, of course, in places where there are no traditional seismic networks. But right now, there's no question, that's a research effort, to be clear. That's research, big bright line. ShakeAlert is a proven technology. ShakeAlert can actually deliver warnings to people. And, and that's why we're moving forward with ShakeAlert. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. I, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we're going to have for, for the questions today. Uh, really appreciate uh, the time you spent with us. As a reminder to the audience, the first two parts of this series are currently available on the Beezer website. And this third webinar will be posted within the next week or so. So check it out. And with that, I'd like to thank our two speakers, Dr. Drs. Allen and Melger, uh, for their presentations. And thank you all again for participating. Have a great day.